isto vamos ver se dá certo, tá vendo? Ó, é, aí. Chega. Na barra inferior, isso. Tá bom? Deu? Tá, tá se você puder Toma colocar feira, aí... Né? Isso, eu, viu? Eu tô, ó, tá, ó, mais feira ainda. Ó. Isso é? mesmo. Tudo Maravilha, bem. tá perfeito. Bom, então, na primeira. Aqui tá a urânia que não me deixa falar muita besteira, tá? Tudo bem. Quando quiser. Tá. Pode começar. Oh, you can start. Sorry. Can you hear me? Oi? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, Jorge, you can start your presentation. Okay, I was... Hello, everybody. I was just uh, about to not prepare to talk in, speak in English because I was about to remember many times in which we did uh, uh, wonderful things with offer. Uh, starting with uh, dancing, uh, you know, this um, sorts of, of things, had lots of caipirinha and a lot of uh, stories about it. It's, um, it's unfortunate that we have to, first of all, to regret his, his death, but on the other hand, um, the legacy of uh, pursuing the um, research is is uh, is something we we should care about. So I I acknowledge the participation in this uh, event by the organizers, and I hope that the things will go ahead with time because this is one of the best things we should uh, 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 pursue to to honor his memory. Okay. Well, I will talk about the supernova neutron star connections. This is a topic in high energy astrophysics that this goes back and forth uh, between um, the end of the stars. And this is uh, work done with Livia Roche, Antonio Bernardo, Lucas Esa, Pedro Moraes, uh, Marcio Avelar and, and Rodolfo yeah. Valentin over the years. Um, and it starts with, the, with something that is a textbook example, then huh? this supernova one uh, of, the, of the year 1054, birth of the club pulsar it was a, a very important event because it was seen in the west and in the east and uh, at that time the issue of the uh, perf the perfections of, of the heavens uh, of course was not shared in, in the in the in the eastern uh, culture but they nevertheless uh, prompted some reflection on what what was going on uh, on that and there's a picture of the emperor henry the third in Tivoli, taking a look at the supernova, and of course, the astronomers, the, the Chinese astronomers recording everything. So everybody knows that, they say, okay, supernova, go, go, go. And after many, many years, of almost 800 years, um, a pulsar was detected there. However, when we take a look at that, there's uh, something that strikes, it's not often emphasized, so I bring it here to, take a look at that, that the, what we observed since 1820 uh, something in which the remnant of the explosion was uh, expected is that precisely what you see in the crab uh, location is not a, a, a pulsar supernova remnant. Um, what is the difference uh, on, on, your, on your left? Uh, there's a real, a true okay. supernova remnant, which is Cassiopeia A. <clears throat> I'm, I'm running a workshop, <laughs> so, so there's going to be some background noise. Um, oh, I, I get it? Background noise. No, More a... noise. Okay. We, I can I go ahead or what? Uh. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So I was talking that the. What you see on your left is modern images of Cassiopeia A. It's not uh, in any case related to what you see at the crab location. So that's, uh, uh, why is it so? Because a supernova remnant should contain, and, and, and in fact does, contain many solar masses. And the crab estimate, on the other hand, is somewhere between one and seven solar masses at most. In fact, what we see there is a pulsar wind nebula. 
is as ionized gas, that the injection of particles from the central object, which is the pulsar, and not the supernova redness. So this is uh, funny that the paradigmatic supernova explosion, the first of all in which a pulsar was born, is just anything but paradigmatic or standard. So uh, the, one of the questions there is what, what happened in the case of, of the crab, uh, actually. I will return to this point later. Uh, the standard classification of supernova after the uh, well the very well-known textbook uh, examples of uh, Bad and Zwicky, calling that type one are the ones that, that don't have a hydrogen, uh, later associated to some thermonuclear explosion of an old population, and a bunch of objects uh, or events uh, that ac are actually confusing because they carry the one um, uh, denomination because they don't have hydrogen, but they thought to, they are thought to be uh, actually stripped uh, massive stars. Uh, first of all, so 1b, which lack of hydrogen, the 1c's that have lack hydrogen and helium as well. So therefore, uh, what we think today is that the uh, these these are probably uh, progenitors of of hypernovae in the sense that the stripped. Uh, envelope in binary systems uh, belong to a, an initially large mass progenitor and may produce gamma ray bursts and give rise to black, black holes after collapse. So uh, there is a whole bunch of other objects in supernova which are called superluminous, which have an energy scale at least 10 times uh, as much as the 10 to the 51 ergs, which is this, the standard value, but they're not shown here. So why uh, these are related to maybe pair instability supernova, very large stars, uh, a subject in which uh, Ruben Offer um, uh, worked some uh, many years ago and, and other uh, vari variations uh, involved uh, energy injection and probably the interstellar uh, uh, medium as well. Um, for completeness, what we uh, really know about the uh, Taiwan A supernova is, is beginning to be challenged because, if, in spite that there being standard candles in the cosmology approach, these thermonuclear events are not known up to, up to now if they are composed of a single or a double generator, means that the, if we really don't know if all of them involve one white dwarf or two white dwarfs that, that fuse or merge. Uh, what is clear is that they have never been associated with a pulsar remnant. Uh, this is an example of the Kepler supernova in, in 1604. And in recent years, even uh, a type of supernova co uh, uh, denominated 1AX may be that they do not disrupt totally the star and left, um, leave something like a, a zombie white dwarf. Uh, I mean, this is. Uh, is, is alive even after a thermonuclear explosion. This is uh, something which is being studied, but nevertheless, I insist that the, there is no formation of neutron stars, which is uh, our topic later. There is another thing which is much more fishy, which is the accretion-induced collapse of a type 2a. This is a very simple concept, uh, not easy to calculate, but easy to explain. The vector capture onto the the super, they may be quicker than the thermonuclear ignitions in white dwarfs. It may happen if the accretion rate and the mass of the white dwarfs and other conditions are in a restricted range. So therefore, uh, they must be rare because the argument is that the ejection of exotic high isotopes will contaminate the galaxy and this is not seen. So therefore, this is a, a, an idea in astrophysics uh, related to many situations, but now when you Take a look at the possibility of that accretion uh, not being actually a supernova, a thermonuclear supernova, rather uh, be, uh, being able to produce neutron stars. Uh, the most uh, favorable channel will be around 1.25 solar masses if it's a single degenerate, but the double degenerate um, may allow masses uh, between 1.4 and 2.8 whatever solar masses. So we are not sure whether the double degenerate exists in a sense of formating um, uh, neutron stars. And uh, if so, it, it may be a channel for the formation of, of neutron stars is uh, totally unrelated to the collapse of massive stars. Um, recently, we have witnessed a very important thing, which is 
the probably the identification, the tentative identification of a supernova coming not from the collapse of an iron core, but rather of the collapse of a degenerate oxygen neon uh, magnesium core, which is the idea here. The idea here is the, if the star, uh, the uh, original mass of the star is around nine solar masses or so, therefore uh, it does not ignite uh, cycles uh, in, in the advanced stage. And therefore it comes up to some configuration in which oxygen neon, and, and magnesium are present. And this may capture electrons and there since it's, it's the generated prompts uh, collapse and, and posterior ejection. But this is in, in interesting because the star is full of oxygen, therefore uh, the oxygen fusion or, or deflagrations uh, energy release makes uh, something like it, which is a thermonuclear source prompted by the collapse of, of the core itself. And therefore, uh, this uh, large group of people from Japan and may, many other peoples have identified one of the events is SM218 ZD, in which a progenitor was identified prior to the explosion, uh, the circumstellar material uh, proving that it, it, it lost uh, the mass loss before the, the explosion itself, the chemical composition, the explosion energy, which is not large, on the contrary, the light curve and the nucleosynthesis all come together to postulate a super AGB progenitor as the, the first identified electron capture supernova. Why, why this is important? Because they produce neutron stars too. And what about the neutron stars by themselves? So since the uh, bodies leak in 1934, there was the idea that the compression of the matter in the collapse will uh, provoke the formation uh, of, of a neutron star. However, uh, if you take a look at papers uh, around 20 years ago, the idea that there was a single mass scale for neutron stars were firmly rooted in the community. Therefore, uh, you, you can find uh, graphs like this. So all the stars, uh, neutron stars measure, which I pile up around 1.4 and say, okay, this is consistent with one unique mass and so on. And uh, when you take a look at the modern um, view of this in which you have all, um, almost 100 systems with uh, measurements in, in various degrees of precision that you see that there is a widespread, this is two solar masses here, this is the old 1.4, and even the binary neutron star, which are 13 right now or so, have a masses that deviate substantially from the 1.4 uh, value. Uh, this is a sample um, uh, compiled by Livia, and we should learn some lessons from this. So what the, uh, what, what, what's the connection between the formation events and the masses of the neutron stars? How did they gain masses in binaries? how much, which is the lowest and highest value. So because the lowest value is related to stellar evolution, maybe one point something around one solar masses. And the largest values are of course related to the stiffness of the equation state able to stand high masses above two solar masses or so right now. Therefore, this has to do with the, with the microscopic degrees of freedom able to produce enough pressure to stand uh, the large uh, mass values. And this uh, in turn means something about the constitution of dense matter about uh, at, at, at many times the solar, uh, the nuclear the, the saturation density. You take a look at, if you take a look at the uh, analysis uh, and make an analysis of that 100 uh, sample, uh, object sample population, you see that even in the most simple frequentist analysis, there is more than one maximum grant. So the old idea that the, there is a single mass scale is, is, is uh, disfavored. And uh, this is seen very clearly here in which a second BAMP up here. You can go to a Bayesian analysis and, and, and say a state, uh, state uh, the, uh, Gaussian peaks and uh, try to find the width and the location of the peaks and then uh, a couple of values appear. So it's uh, one, uh, single values is completely disfavored, but two values, one around 1.35, which is similar to the 1.04, and um, another one at 1.76 or so appear. But then you can do better and, and, and ask what 
happens with the maximum mass. If we introduce, for example, a cutoff and treat the maximum mass as an additional parameter as uh, reflected by the, uh, by the distribution itself. Then this truncation gives uh, you back a calculation and an estimation of the probability that the maximum is, uh, is there and the maximum is very wi wide and uh, it happens to be centered around 2.5 solar masses. So this is not the maximum mass, it's rather is the maximum mass uh, suggested by the shape of the probability that should coincide uh, with the, max, the physical maximum mass allowed by uh, strong interactions in uh, the limit uh, of a very large sample. Um, it, it, we found that this is a probability distribution depends little on the big errors because this is already that the Bayesian um, frameworks already handled very well, but it does depend on the prior. Therefore, you can do you know all kinds of, of, of hypotheses about the prior uh, of the distribution and essentially it then coincide with this naive three sigma frequentist value and therefore you should expect that a large, a large value of, uh, of maximum mass. If these are confirmed for individual objects, which is something that the physicists do all the time, they say, okay, it must be at least two, two solar masses. But however, there's more information in the whole distribution than in single objects. So it's, it's not just to be, you say, okay, okay, we, we should go up to two solar masses, 2.1 or something, but rather, suggest that it may uh, that you have to go up to 2.5 solar masses and also this is in, in turn this is much closer to the rose ruffini limit which is the totally causal uh, causal uh, structure which is over you know, around three solar masses but also makes room for a 2.5 solar masses neutron stars in the celebrated uh, event of the gravitational waves 19 08 to 14. So we do not use any hypothesis about this, uh, the lightest object in this uh, 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 event. Nevertheless, we obtain from the very local distribution uh, some indication that this may be a neutron star after all. So this uh, has been going over for you know, years, uh, a decade or so. In, in 2011, we obtained very similar values. And there are other words that uh, um, obtain similar values, uh, they with some variation. And um, these, these results are uh, stronger with the new data. And therefore, we don't know if uh, there's another question right now. Are all these neutron stars a product of, for example, the heavy ones a product of the accretion, or some of them are born like that? Are some of them born massive? Because we do know from stellar evolution that around at the progenitor mass of around 19 solar masses, there is a very big jump in the size of the oxygen core, which reflects, should reflect in the formation of very massive object because this is essentially what the uh, iron uh, core is about. Um, there is people that uh, argue that uh, the heaviest uh, measure pulsar it was born like that for kinematical reasons. And therefore, uh, we should take a look at whether the supernova explosions or so, which could uh, produce heavy neutron star from scratch without any accretion. One interesting case of that that have been studied over the years is the so-called spider system. Spider systems are kind of low mass exobinaries in which a couple of ingredients are um, uh, also um, driving the evolution. One, uh, the first of all, is that the, the, there is uh, proximity of the of the uh, system in which you feedback um, uh, feedback. Uh, X-rays from the accretion, and later on, when the accretion has accelerated the pulsar, then the wind of the pulsar begins to ablate the uh, the companion. This is why uh, the thing here, which is a superposition of of images, looks like a comet because this is what it is: the wind of the sun in the case case of the pulsar it makes the the long tail, and the tail you see here is produced by the uh, pulsar. Uh, stripping the matter from the, the, the generate object that is uh, coming here. Uh, why I bring this here? Because 
the, uh, we studied with the people from La Plata, the uh, secular evolution is a very long uh, creation time scales from here when you start the evolution to the minimum, which is around a period of about hours prior to the uh, ablation phase that goes all the way up here. And this phase takes many, um, takes many giga years and uh, a few giga years. And when you go back and try to measure the binaries, the masses of the binaries, you find consistently that the neutron stars inside the spiders, you know, red back black widows or spiders type, are among the highest values um, you can you can you measure. If you take a look at any other phenomenon and take a look at that as an astronomer, you would say, okay, this is the evolution is driving the systems as you know far as possible as uh, the as massive as possible as the uh, neutron star can do, even dangerously close to the black hole absolute uh, limit of the road surface. Uh, Even Charles, though the, four, four minutes, yeah. four minutes. Four, okay, so I, I go ahead. So I don't have time to do this. I will uh, take a look at that. So first of all, there are maybe those are the most massive neutron stars in the universe. And probably some of them have been pushed to form uh, light black holes. And therefore there is a lot of study here in the boundaries between the stars that explode the stars the, the first by electron capture, after that by the iron core um, supernovae. And, and, and this, these are uh, a compilation of calculations. It's super AGB's uh, uh, range uh, or here, and, um, and the, the uh, upper limit uh, in which you start to form iron cores there. The, what, which is important, why is important here? Because on the one hand, the electron capture supernova should have a fixed mass for the neutron star because the uh, core is essentially always having the same mass. On the other hand, when you measure something like 1.17, uh, et cetera, et cetera, for some you know, very well measured neutron star, they cannot come then from uh, electron capture supernova. They must be the lightest iron, the smallest iron cores from progenitors above nine solar masses. This is therefore, this is a very in interesting number to have, which is the, 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 the lightest neutron star you can see. And this is a very important thing that you would like to, to, to stress. Not only in single star evolution, but also in uh, binary star evolution with the prescription is just to, to, to take, uh, to, to give away the, 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 the envelope, you do not uh, see in the simulations the formation of black holes after a, a, a really big mass. On the contrary, what you see is that the, the, the neutron star form here at a certain mass, you can start to form black holes, then the neutron star return. And even at the very, very large progenitors in binaries, for example, around 40 or 50 solar masses in, the, in, the, in this uh, main sequence, uh, the results indicate that you may form not only neutron star, but very heavy neutron star. Therefore, this idea that you start to form black holes over 25 masses, so it's over. It's not, it's not true. It, it they depend on the details of how to treat the convection and many other um, ingredients of the calculations. And it's very likely that the process of formation of neutron stars or black holes is not easy, is not is driven by, um, I, I wouldn't say chaotic, but uh, really intermittent uh, fashion. Uh, therefore, where we stand. Yeah? Uh, this is the theoretical limit. This is something everybody calculates. This is the three spiders that bridges man around here. This is the compact object in uh, GW 1908-14. And therefore, uh, now you, you think that the stars are dangerously close to the maximal unrealistic stiffness of the rho Ruffini put in P well C uh, rho uh, C squared. Um, we don't know what the, the nature does, but uh, my conclusions are that never please uh, talk or write the canonical mass again, because there's nothing canonical in neutron stars. There's a maximum around 1.4, but there's no just such a thing that mass distribution is very wide. 
the even the double neutron stars, the double pools, and they are not symmetrical in mass. There are many, many. Uh, at least uh, the, there's a strong uh, indication of of very strong, a strongly asymmetric double neutron star systems. At least two of them that will fuse and produce that wonderful kilonova events and so on. But when you make the hypothesis, those are symmetrical in mass. You may be uh, committing a very large uh, error. So the mass gap, so-called mass gap between the heaviest neutron stars and the lightest black holes may be being filled. We don't know, we, we do know that the spiders um, can uh, harbor very massive neutron stars and may, may be that some low mass black holes around three solar masses or so may be hidden and we, uh, could be a, a byproduct of, of spiders or uh, some other process. Therefore, there, uh, there is a, a need to, to deepen the search of low mass uh, black holes there to understand what, what's going on there. And of course, the description of the dense matter above nuclear saturation density is, is, is being pushed up by measurements. Therefore, you have to, all people say, okay, we have to consider over two solar masses. And maybe we have to go much, much beyond that and that, then the uh, history of the, 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 the way of approaching that will be uh, cumbersome um, because we have to understand interactions, very repulsive interactions between particles and so on and so forth. And that, that's, my, that's what I had to say. Uh, I would say Shalom Mofer, if he was here, I know his deep interest in, in those uh, kind of uh, all sorts of, of natural phenomena. And I really um, take the opportunity to thank him uh, and collaborators over many, many years of fun and wonderful uh, research and, and discussions and, and, and many, other, many other things. Therefore, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jasmine, for your excellent talk. And I would like to open to, to one question, uh, just due to the, the time. And then we can let the other questions for the discussion session, okay? okay. So, yes. <laughs> anyone would like to make a question? If so, please raise your hand. Sorry, uh, Gustavo, please go ahead. I think I think it'd be easier to just discuss. Gustavo. Well, uh, hello. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, no, it's yeah, 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 yeah. Hello, Jorge. Hello. Nice, nice talk. Thank you. So, uh, the, I, I've seen some simulations in the past of, of the explosion of supernova. So do you know what is the stage of, of most recent simulations and what of all of these that you have described is, is, is being uh, inferred from these uh, new new models? Yes, okay. Uh, first of all, the, um, uh, what uh, we had the luck of, uh, of inviting Adam Burroughs uh, this year to give a talk at the EIJ, which was uh, uh, actually very open and he explained to us uh, very swiftly that the uh, essential ingredient for the supernova explosion seems to be the multi-dimensional effects associated to the rise and, and the development of hydrodynamical instabilities coupled to the neutrino emission and so on. Therefore, uh, models that did not explode in one dim dimension now are seen to explode uh, when the, uh, the, the uh, treatment of neutrino uh, interactions and so on allow the fluid to develop the full instabilities in three dimensions. This is uh, something very important. And after the, but the the uh, connection with what with, with I said it is I, I found it really amazing because he stressed that they obtain formation of neutron stars and black holes from almost any mass about 10 solar masses, depending slightly on the 
uh, way they treat the uh, convection and the other uh, you know, important ingredients in uh, the pre-supernova evolution. Therefore, it seems to, uh, to be that the, this idea that uh, after some mass, you, have, you must go and everything should produce black holes is, is not, is not, uh, is not what, what, what happens. Uh, unless there's something very, very uh, heavy and, and unknown still to be discovered about the separation of that. And therefore, um, it should be very, very careful about what do you uh, state about a, a real and actual explosion. Because, mm -hmm. for example, it's almost clear right now that with um, the Crab Nebula explosion was something like uh, an electron capture supernova. It's very, very likely that the first um, you know, scene there was not an iron core, a normal development of an iron core all the way up to the iron peak, but rather the electron capture supernova of a lighter progenitor around nine solar masses or so. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it, it did produce a, a, a pulsar, but it's not the event you should see from say 10 solar masses on. Therefore, it's, uh, there's a lot of things to, to be uh, uh, clarified in that uh, uh, performation. But the, as long as the explosion itself goes, they seek the explanation of the failure of uh, initial models on initial mean for 30, 30 years or so to the uh, dimensionality, uh, mm -hmm. reduced dimensionality and the uh, floppy, uh, incomplete treatment of all the ingredients that go. Mm -hmm. mm, great, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Back to all the data and blocks. now so we are going we, to we, have we, the talk to Dr. Kobo. Is that right, Kobo? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, okay. can, you you? can you hear me? So, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. And yeah, I am going to, to, to inform you that it's just go, five minutes, so to the end of the so, okay. so uh, you can so start. Please, uh, show us if you could uh, oh, think to a lot. And then when we actually build the CCR object. I'm sorry, the background noise. It's my husband. It's He's in a telecom, so sorry about that. So you can start. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but actually, my wife is. is... Yeah, uh, you can see you are mute. Uh, Coco, you are mute. I will try to move to the to the bottom. Just a second. I I am not familiar with uh, Zoom, but I see when I share, it asks yeah. to to share tab audio. Uh, but maybe now it's going to be working. Okay, uh, can you see uh, my... Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Can you uh, we can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's perfect. Great. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me. Uh, I didn't... I probably met uh, Ofer once when I arrived in IAG for my pe uh, first postdoc. It was 2009. But I think a few months later, he... he he retired and moved uh, to the States. But uh, of course, I, I recognize, recognize his influence because many of my, my colleagues uh, were uh, directly affected, you know, uh, inspired by, uh, by, his, by his idea. And of course, I, I know about the, the, his influence on the, the astrophysical research here in, here in Brazil. So uh, my talk will, will be about spontaneous magnetic reconnection. Uh, uh, I am showing you the, the, the list of uh, closest uh, collaborators, Diego from uh, USP, uh, Elizabeth uh, from Yage, uh, Alex Lazarian, Ethan Wisniak from the States, uh, Amir Jafari as well from uh, John Hopkins, Hopkins Uni University, and uh, Jiang Fu Zhang, and my recent collaborator, uh, we, uh, uh, not all of them uh, work on the, the magnetic reconnection directly, but some of them uh, collaborate with me 
on the related uh, aspects like the particle acceleration uh, by uh, magnetic reconnection. So uh, my talk will be divided in my more or less five parts. I will talk briefly about magnetic rec reconnection. I see there are a number of uh, participants. Uh, maybe not all of them uh, know what exactly the magnetic reconnection is. So uh, I would like to introduce. Then uh, I will talk about challenges for, for the magnetic reconnection in astrophysics. And then I will switch to uh, describe the, discuss a little bit uh, our results on uh, turbulence produced by uh, reconnection and what drives this turbulence and how this reconnection converts energy, magnetic energy into other forms of energy. So uh, starting about the, the magnetic reconnection process itself, it's, uh, it's relatively easy to describe. If you imagine plasma, uh, plasma is typically magnetic field with, uh, with uh, ions and electrons bound to magnetic field lines moving uh, together with the magnetic field. So we call that the states is the, the particles are frozen in the magnetic field. So uh, the state is described far from, uh, from this uh, rectangular in the middle. Uh, but if uh, this, uh, those particles are brought into a region where uh, the polarization, the direction of magnetic field lines uh, changes uh, suddenly, uh, they start to feel some effects and decouple from the magnetic field lines and create a sort of a current, a electric current plane, which we called a current sheet or a diffusion region. And then uh, those, those particles are ejected and the magnetic field is reconnected in, ejected in the, on the sides of this image. So you can see that the, the process itself is, is relatively simple, but it uh, brings a lot of challenges. And it, this process also, also is uh, encountered in many astrophysical sites, which you can see here, for example. Magnetic reconnection is responsible for solar flares, uh, cosmic mass ejections, uh, uh, other uh, features of the dynamical features of the so solar surface and obviously uh, other stars. Uh, it is studied in the laboratory. Uh, it is uh, responsible for uh, processes in the, our magnetosphere, uh, Earth's mag magnetosphere, but also it is very important for uh, relativistic uh, uh, objects uh, like uh, active galactic nuclei jets, uh, it can be responsible for uh, gamma ray bursts and product production of cosmic ray, uh, of high energy cosmic rays. So uh, this, uh, this magnetic reconnection uh, process, it's, uh, it could be said uh, one of the most important uh, processes uh, in, the, in the astrophysical pl plasma. And of course, it is uh, also um, uh, confirmed by uh, a huge number of uh, papers published every year on this subject. Uh, so uh, these papers, uh, even uh, the number of the, uh, those papers is huge, uh, try to touch uh, many challenges uh, for the magnetic uh, reconnection. And even uh, we have so many papers, they. Uh, they just bite a bit of, of uh, those challenges, trying to explain uh, uh, what happens with this rec magnetic reconnection. So I listed here and a number of the most important uh, uh, challenges for magnetic reconnection. Uh, uh, since uh, since uh, realizing it is important in the astrophysical plasma, it was uh, tried to uh, uh, un understood in terms of the how fast the, the pro this process is. Because it's it's since it is uh, responsible for uh, like explosive phenomena uh, in the we observe, for example, it has uh, it means that this reconnection rate has to be uh, fast to explain the this uh, explosive character. Uh, the other challenge is that uh, magnetic reconnection involves uh, um, many scales. Uh, the systems are uh, the astrophysical systems are lar large. But the, the reconnection itself happens in a very small, very thin region, uh, uh, this dissipation region, uh, on the scale of uh, electron E and ion gyro radio. 
And of course, uh, this, this, uh, we, we are aware that the astrophysical, astrophysical uh, systems are very large comparing to, to those scales. Uh, since the, the beginning, the uh, magnetic wave connection was studied in 2D, but uh, last couple of decades uh, or 10, 10 years, uh, we realized that the, the 2D is a huge limitation. A magnetic field by, by itself is, uh, uh, is uh, divergence free, which uh, means that it can only uh, create loops of magnetic field lines and the, these loops can uh, loops cannot simply reconnect and uh, be produced, generated. They 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 can be amplified, uh, but uh, of course uh, this uh, the two D uh, puts a lot of limitation for the evolution of such uh, magnetic field loops. Uh, another challenge is the, uh, the question on uh, where the magnetic uh, field is uh, converted uh, during this process. Uh, usually, uh, the earlier study suggested uh, that they produce a lot of heat because of the, the nonlinear effects, the local resistivity enhancement. But we see that uh, also that they can produce a lot of uh, uh, plasma motions uh, from the ejection regions. And uh, also, they can effectively and efficiently produce uh, non thermal particles. Uh, and uh, the next, uh, the next challenge is the, the what is the relation of uh, between reconnection and turbulence and shocks? We learned recently that a turbulence or turbulent cascade and reconnection can live uh, uh, can cannot uh, live one without another. And uh, in MHD and magnetized uh, turbulence, for example. And finally, the reconnection onset. Uh, is this process um, stationary or it's just like explosive one happening in, in a very short uh, period of time and then this uh, this uh, setup uh, uh, builds up the energy to to be released in, in some time in a violent uh, form uh, once more time so uh, all those challenges make very difficult to uh, to study the, the magnetic reconnection, especially in the theor theoretical and uh, observational uh, way. Uh, but uh, to study a phenomenon, uh, we have to build some kind of th theory first. Uh, in 1957, uh, uh, there was a proposed um, famous uh, model of the magnetic reconnection by Sweet and Parker, which involves just uh, the, the mentioned configuration of the uh, two magnetic uh, two regions uh, characterized by, by uh, the uh, magnetic field with different uh, uh, direction, and uh, inside this uh, this uh, this red blob, uh, which we call the diffusion region, uh, the reconnection happens and magnetic reconnects and it's ejected on the sides of this picture. So this diffusion region is characterized by two scales, lambda, which is the thickness, and l, which is the length of this uh, dissipation re uh, region. That's, that's great. Uh, uh, building, uh, using the uh, con uh, conservation of mass and momentum, we can derive that the inflow uh, produced by the reconnection rate is uh, related to the Alphen speed uh, times uh, a number s, which is called a loop twist number. It's di dimensionless number, which determines what's the relation between large scale and small scale, kinetic scale. Uh, here, uh, eta is the resistivity, magnetic resistivity. And uh, so the, the speed uh, of the bringing the magnetic field toward this uh, dissipation region is uh, determined by the Alphen speed times the Lundquist number uh, to minus half. Great. Uh, this means that estimating eta, we can uh, estimate uh, immediately the, uh, the reconnection rate in a given environment. But the situation is not that, um, not that nice. Uh, if we consider, for example, magnetosphere, uh, solar, a solar corona, uh, solar flares, uh, interstellar medium, or uh, relativistic jets, we can estimate from the speed resistivity 
that this S is very huge, uh, 10 to 14, uh, 10 to 8, 10 to 16, at least uh, in the interstellar medium, 10 to uh, even higher, 10 to uh, 34 for uh, relativistic jets. This S means uh, it's so huge that it means the sweet reconnection uh, is extremely inefficient. It was in the 60s, uh, last, uh, last um, um, uh, uh, in the 1960s. So since then, of course, the researchers started to look uh, for uh, processes which can enhance uh, this uh, reconnection rate uh, uh, significantly. Of course, uh, the first was uh, suggested that uh, why do we have to work with constant resistivity? This resistivity is, uh, is determined by the uh, uh, kinetic properties at micro scale. So let's include some processes like ambipolar diffusion, which is the interaction by electric field between uh, moving electrons and ions, or a Hall effect or other kinetic uh, effects. And these effects usually enhance the resistivity. Uh, but these effects uh, work uh, usually only when the, we neglect collisions between uh, particles. So uh, in the 60s, there was uh, proposed uh, another uh, different way to, to enhance the, uh, the reconnection rate by uh, changing the geometry. So if we uh, shrink the length of the current sheet, decrease the, the ratio between the length and the, the thickness of the current sheet, in some way we can enhance the, uh, the reconnection rate. This was called the Pechek model. Uh, but it turned out that the Petrick model is not, not stable if uh, resistivity is uh, uniform, constant, and uh, only it can be made stable if the resistivity is, uh, is uh, localized. Uh, in, uh, in the end of the uh, last age, uh, in 1999, uh, Lazarian Vishniak proposed um, a model based on the interaction between reconnection and turbulence. So turbulence basically stratifies the current sheet, uh, allows the, the many reconnection sites to occur at the same time. And for uh, you can see here in the, in the bottom part of the, of, of the picture that the, then the turbulence is, decreases the longitudinal length of the, each uh, reconnection uh, rate, reconnection event. And this enhances the uh, both local reconnection and global reconnection. reconnection. They found that uh, surprising, uh, surprisingly, it, this reconnection is not dependent on the uh, microphysics any, anymore. It only depends on, on the properties, properties of the turbulence itself, on the injection scale uh, and on the injection amplitude of velocity. Uh, this model was tested in uh, 2000, 2009, uh, 2012 by me and my collaborators, and we could recover all the uh, the theoretical uh, uh, predictions like the, this. Uh, you can see, for example, here is the power dependence. If there is no turbulence, is the horizontal line. On the, on the X, uh, vertical uh, X, we, we see the uh, reconnection rate. Here we have the, the, uh, the power of turbulence injection uh, changing. If we increase, uh, we can uh, increase the, the reconnection rate. If we increase the power of the turbulence, we can increase the reconnection rate. Uh, in, the, in the plot below, you can see the dependence on the reconnection rate on the injection scale. If we in increase the injection scale, inject turbulence at larger scales, uh, we can get a, a fa faster reconnection. And the most important part is the, the plot on the right, uh, which shows how the reconnection rate depends on the uh, resistivity, uniform resistivity. And you can see that the open, open uh, diamonds show the sweet Parker reconnection uh, is recovered uh, very well. Uh, this is uh, the case without externally driven turbulence. And once the turbulence is uh, switched on, the reconnection uh, rate uh, quickly increases to a level of more or less 0 0.1. The level which is typically observed in, the, in many astrophysical sites. 
So uh, this work was done with externally driven turbulence. And uh, we decided to, to verify, OK, what if the uh, reconnection drives turbulence by, by itself? So we don't drive this uh, turbulence externally. You can see here a, a movie showing uh, how the initially uh, uh, initial perturbation injected into the, the neighborhood of the reconnection of the current sheet can produce turbulence. This is the vorticity you can see. And you can see that the turbulent region is uh, growing up, increases the thickness, and, uh, and affecting the reconnection itself. So on the left uh, side, you can see how the kinetic energy in the system increases. It increases very quickly. The, the time scale is logarithmic. So uh, in a fraction of, of uh, alpha and time, you can see uh, increase of the kinetic energy by a few, uh, few orders of magnitude. Okay. And can, I, can, can I interrupt? So the conditions here are magnetic fields pointing in different directions, the top and bottom? As a, exactly, yes, yes. Ah, okay. And uh, you just have the uh, very weak initial perturbation of velocity injected in the system. And the system is periodic, uh, except the vertical uh, boundaries, which are open. So you can bring the magnetic flux toward the, the system. OK. So uh, OK, so we, we demonstrated that the, the, the reconnection can, uh, can produce turbulence uh, by itself and therefore enhance its rate. Uh, probably in a lazarian vishniak uh, compatible uh, lazarian vishniak model compatible way and we studied the, the properties of the, this turbulence generated and we discovered that this uh, this turbulence uh, follows very nicely the kolmogorov uh, spectrum which is also the uh, the predicted uh, power spectrum slope for the goldreich streetcar model of magnetized uh, strongly magnetized turbulence and the same is uh, in terms of the, the scaling of the anisotropy of the velocity fluctuations. It is also, we can see that the scaling is, uh, is compatible with the Goldberg street hard turbulence. So it means that the, this, uh, the, the reconnection can produce, uh, can produce the, uh, the turbulence. Uh, so the next question arrived, uh, what ex exactly produces this turbulence? how the, the uh, reconnection converts the magnetic field into uh, turbulent motions. So of course, uh, since we have this uh, very simplified uh, model of, of the uh, of a uniform magnetic field uh, with different polarization or direction in the bottom and upper part of the box, uh, initially we consider a tearing mode, which is very typical for this kind of configuration. Initially, we don't have the uh, velocity shear in the system, but we were curious if this shear is not, uh, not built up due to the uh, local uh, reconnection events uh, or ejections, uh, plasma ejections from the local reconnection events, which are not necessarily aligned due to the initial perturbations. So- uh, oh, uh, Sorry, five minutes. Okay, so briefly, uh, uh, we, we, took, we, we uh, did a research on the analytical works related to resistive uh, tearing mode. We, we got the conditions for the stability. K here is the wave number of the perturbation. Delta is the thickness of the current sheet in the system. We can see that the uh, growth rates uh, are, uh, have those two scalings, two regimes of the growth rates, depending on the, the parameter, which is this alpha. This is product K uh, uh, times delta and the Lundquist number. And we derive the, what is the maximum, uh, maximum growth rate, uh, uh, including also the, the presence of the uh, trans transverse uh, magnetic field, which is uh, direct, direct perpendicular to the current sheet. And we could estimate the maximum growth rate wave number. And the second, uh, Kelvin Hellman's instability, we consider that uh, the, the shear, velocity shear, should have a smooth profile, not the typically assumed uh, discontinuous pro profile. And we found in, uh, in old uh, papers some analytical uh, spatial relations for the compressible magnetized case, 
you can you have some uh, some uh, parameters described here alpha is the same wave number uh, of the perturbation times the thickness of the uh, velocity shear and u is the shear amplitude amplitude and gamma is the growth rate and we did a, a, a study and extracted the the regions in this this spontaneous uh, reconnection um, uh, system uh, by studying the shear uh, stress tensile applied to velocity field and to uh, magnetic field so these two instabilities basically are related to to the shear of different uh, vector fields Kelvin Helm holds to the velocity shear and uh, tearing mode to the magnetic shear so we uh, extracted all the regions where the, the, the instabilities can grow. And we, we uh, analyzed, for example, the current sheet thickness, delta, how it changes during the evolution, the, the land, uh, 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 the land in the, in the bottom. Uh, this is the, the histograms of the current sheet uh, thickness and land. Uh, and on the vertical, you have the number of samples and the same for the velocity shear. You can see that, uh, for example, current sheet becomes thinner during the evolution and, and becomes more fragmented. So the longitudinal length decreases, velocity shear becomes thicker. So the Kelvin Helmholtz can work more, more easily and vorticity shear region lengths expand. It's on the contrary, uh, comparing to current sheet. And we determined the, the histograms of the uh, maximum growth rate for both uh, instabilities. And we, we concluded that uh, even uh, though the uh, tearing mode initially is uh, more favorable, uh, after some time when the, the velocity shear is developed, a Kelvin Helmholtz uh, seen on the right uh, becomes dominant. Uh, both in the terms of the feeling factor, the, the, the volume, where it takes place, as well as it, it reaches uh, nearly one order of magnitude uh, faster growth rates. So, uh, so of course, this is a very interesting result showing that it not only expected plasmoid or Turing mode uh, uh, instability is responsible for production, the production of uh, turbulent eddies, but also Kelvin Helmholtz. So uh, the, the next step would be to, I, I mentioned that uh, one of the challenges is the understanding where this magnetic energy goes. Uh, is, it, uh, uh, is, is it hitting the environment or is it uh, accelerating the environment? Here you can see a, a plot, a time evolution of the, you can see here in the, the square, uh, terms. If you just uh, take the, the the equations for the evolution of of magnetic field, you can see that it has certain components like the transfer uh, of the magnetic field through the boundaries, conversion of the magnetic uh, field, as you can see in the the third line, to kinetic energy, and the fourth line, uh, the pink one, is the uh, transfer of the magnetic energy uh, into the heat of the plasma. And you can see that during this evolution, uh, the, the pink line, which is the, the heat heating of the plasma is uh, relatively not changing. It is, it is the same, uh, it has the same uh, uh, magnitude as the, the, uh, the initial uh, period. While the uh, conversion to a kinetic energy increases, this is the this brown line. So it means that this continuous reconnection, which produces turbulence, converts a lot of energy into turbulent uh, velocity to, uh, fluc uh, fluctuations, velocity eddies. Uh, at the same time, I, I show here in uh, with the blue line the the reconnection rate. You can see that the the reconnection rate enhances significantly. We are talking about numerical simulations. Numerical simulations are highly limited compar comparing to uh, real astrophysical environments. This simulation was done for Lundquist number 10 to 5, which is uh, a little bit smaller than the, the highest uh, Lundquist numbers uh, um, achieved in the numerical simulations of a magnetic reconnection, which is around 10 to, to 6. But still, uh, if you remember the numbers for the uh, real astrophysical uh, environments, this number is uh, much, much higher. What we expect that with S increasing this, uh, this uh, ratio between the 
enhance the reconnection rate, for example, and reconnection before developing turbulence, uh, which be much higher, will be much higher. So my conclusions are that magnetic uh, reconnection is the most important plasma process responsible for high energy cosmic uh, reproduction, which I didn't show here, but we have a lot of uh, uh, research done in this area. And many astro astrophysical phenomena char characterized by rapid uh, energy release, uh, conversion of the magnetic, uh, magnetic energy into other forms of energy. This magnetic energy usually is uh, this accumulated uh, and once it reaches some kind of level, uh, uh, threshold, it, it is released uh, very quickly. Even though there was a huge amount of research devoted to reconnection, it, 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 is still, uh, it still remains barely understood. Uh, there are many aspects which uh, I, I participate in the, in the reconnection events and I see that there are always some fractions, people uh, arguing and so definitely the, 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 the question was not answered. Uh, all those uh, challenges were not answered uh, by now. No? Spontaneous reconnection is able to produce gold drag street compatible turbulence. Uh, both Turing mode as well as Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities are responsible for this uh, uh, production. Uh, we didn't, uh, we of course didn't uh, consider uh, the possibility that there is some kind of different uh, instability involved, but uh, the, those, these two uh, instabilities are already uh, showing some, some uh, interesting uh, contribution. And developed turbulence enhances the global reconnection rate indeed uh, in accordance with Lazar and Vishniak model, although we didn't uh, verify if the predictions are the same, probably the predictions, the relations on the amount of energy converted uh, could be different, but uh, it shows at least that the, the reconnection, the global reconnection rate is, uh, increases once the ter turbulence is generated in the vicinity of, of the current sheet. And uh, it also uh, shows that the, the increase of heating is not very uh, high but most of the energy goes into uh, plasma, plasma motions. And once we include cosmic rays or, or thermal particles, we can see also that a significant amount of, of uh, magnetic energy can be converted into uh, high energy, energetic cosmic rays. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Thank you. Any questions? If so, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, Gustavo, please. <laughs> Hello. No, that's great. That's great. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> Hello, Greg. Nice to see Hi, you. Hi, how are you? Uh, so let, let me. I have, have two questions. First, how do you measure in the in the simulations the reconnection rate? Technically, I mean. How? Yeah. So if if you see this this plot uh, plot here the, in the, the uh, I show now. You can see that we can actually measure the reconnection rate in a different uh, ways. For example, for this system, uh, we can uh, measure how many, how much energy we have in the system. We can take the time der derivative to, mm -hmm. to measure how it changes in the system. Then we include how much uh, 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 magnetic energy, how much of the magnetic energy is brought from the boundaries, through the mm -hmm. boundaries, and how much, how, much, how the amount of uh, magnetic energy is, which is converted to other uh, forms of energy, like heating and uh, and uh, kinetic energy, right? Mm -hmm. So if you sub subtract these uh, these quantities from the time uh, der derivative of the uh, the integrated magnetic energy, you can uh, estimate how much is converted. In fact. Okay, because because the most important component here is the reconnection, right? Exactly. There is no other <clears throat> process. Okay. And and, and and my second question is: Let me see if, if if I understood well this this process. Then, so you have some magnetic field which is which is uh, an initial configuration, and you perturbate it with a very small perturbation, and yeah. then suddenly you have a kind of an explosive event where exactly. the yeah. And and, it, it and at the end, in a fraction of often time. 
And at the end of the, of the, the final result is decaying turbulence. Yes, you're right, uh, but it depends on the plasma beta, uh, which I am studying uh, for the next paper. Uh, for example, if you have a uh, low uh, plasma beta, which means that you have more compressibility in the system, uh, this somehow the system is sustained, even uh -huh. if the, the box is periodic. Right. The, probably it's heating and the, the, the amount of the region of the, where the uh, kinetic energy is increasing increases as well. So the system has some, some um, let's say, uh, a volume to, to uh, bring more energy to, toward the system. Right. Mm -hmm. But for example, if you consider a high beta uh, system, you see this quick increase of the reconnection and then the turbulence starts to decay. Decay, okay. Of course, uh, we don't have, we have periodic box. So the, if you would be able to re remove this, uh, this amount of reconnected flux, this process would probably uh, go longer. Mm -hmm. like, an, like an sphere. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. A, 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 a beautiful presentation. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe we can have now the, the break for lunch. And please, uh, let's continue keep this discussion of the morning section uh, this afternoon. Okay. And so see you at uh, 2 p.m. Just to confirm here, sorry. Yes, let's be back um, at 2 p.m. See you later. Have a nice lunch. And thank you, Kovac.